The Tom Woods Show, episode 560. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, a whole lot of Tom Woods Show listeners are now getting cash rebates for the online purchases they make thanks to Ebates, which sends them checks. Plus, they send you 100 bucks if you sign up just three people. Check it out through TomWoods.com slash Ebates. Hello and welcome to the second to last episode of 2015. Oh my goodness, where has the time gone? But what a terrific episode it is. It's almost criminal that I saved this one for the second to last episode of the year. It's with Professor Paul Cantor, who is currently the Clifton Waller Barrett Professor at the University of Virginia. He holds his PhD from Harvard University, and he focuses on literature and liberty. And he associates himself with the Austrian school, and as a matter of fact, and I'm going to ask him about this, he even attended Ludwig von Mises' private seminar at New York University in the early 1960s. So quite an interesting person to talk to. He's the author of numerous books on both high culture and what we might call popular culture, Gilligan Unbound, Pop Culture in the Age of Globalization, Literature and the Economics of Liberty. I'm going to link to these, remember, on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 560. That one you can get for free, as a matter of fact, and several other volumes as well. So let's talk to him. Before we do that, let me point out that once again, this is a totally different day that I'm recording this one, but I, it so happens that Elizabeth Woods is sitting here with me once again and might want to say hi to everybody. Do you want to say hi? Hi, guys. Hi, guys. How are you doing today, Elizabeth? Good. It's just before Christmas, right? Yes, I'm very excited. You're very excited. Yeah, me too. We're going to have a lot of fun this Christmas, right? Yes. We sure are. All right. Well, that's Elizabeth Woods, and now we're going to talk to Paul Cantor. Professor Cantor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I want to talk about literature, of course, but how can we not say a little something about Ludwig von Mises? Because you, for one year, apparently attended his famous seminar at NYU, where many people who became successful uh, academics in the Austrian tradition also attended. But that means you knew... Mises, personally, well, what are your recollections? Well, he was a very elegant, old-world gentleman. Uh, that struck me very much at the time. I was, very, I was about 15 years old at the time, uh, but I was very struck how well-dressed he always was and how he carried himself with a courtly manner, which I've learned to associate with the Habsburg Empire. It's very strange. I mean, I really feel that I was in touch with that uh, old-world Vienna by meeting this great man, uh, and he was a wonderful teacher. What was it set up like? Was it discussion? Was it him lecturing? Well, it was mostly him lecturing. It's what I call a European seminar. Uh, he would speak for about an hour, typically an hour and 15 minutes, and then took questions, and often the uh, debate grew lively. Murray Rothbard was in that seminar regularly, and he did uh, love to challenge Mises. And uh, There was one occasion when Friedrich Hayek showed up, and Hayek and Rothbard got into an argument. So it was lively, but it, uh, what I most like was just listening to Mises talk. Oh, sure. No question about it. But of course, my listeners are going to have me lynched if I don't ask you if you recall what Rothbard and Hayek argued about. Well, it was actually a misunderstanding. Uh, uh, let's see. Who, uh, it, was, it had something to do with uh, Hayek proposing a hypothetical. We were talking about the Federal Reserve, and the seminar used to meet quite close to where the Federal Reserve in New York is. And uh, 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 someone had said something about uh, the convertibility of uh, uh, money to gold as if it were still available uh, in 1962, and uh, Hayek pulled out a $50 bill, which was a lot of money in those days, and said, uh, I think it was to Rothbard, why don't you just uh, go down to the Fed Reserve, it's two blocks away, and get me $50 worth of gold for this. Uh, it, uh, I was later told that Hayek's hearing had gotten a little bad at that point, that it was probably just a misunderstanding. Okay, all right. Well, had to ask, had to ask. All I right. can see why. Uh, you are probably 
I've talked to a sociologist or two, but I would say that in terms of literature, you are one of a handful, and I think that handful contains only one person, because I can't think of anybody else I, I know of offhand whose specialty is literature, who identifies with the Austrian school. So let's, of course, start there. In the field of literary criticism, Austrians are, you know, not exactly overrepresented. I think so. What exactly? Say, there are about five others. <laughs> there is a handful. Okay, there is a handful. All right, so a half a dozen, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, first of all, what exactly is the field of literary criticism, and why is it? Is there is there a way we can account for how it's come to be so dominated by the left? Is it the nature of the field? Well, first I should say that we're talking about one wing of literary criticism, that is people who talk about economics and literature. There's a vast portion of literary criticism that has nothing to do with economics and is not particularly Marxist. A lot of literary criticism is purely formal. When people talk about the length of a sonnet is 14 lines, they're not making a Marxist statement. Uh, but it is true that insofar as literary critics uh, talk about economics, they are almost uniformly Marxist or pseudo-Marxist or quasi-Marxist. Uh, uh, that in part has a historical dimension, is that it is, it is the Marxists who first began to talk about literature and economics. Marx and Engels were very much interested in literature. They were old world Germans in that sense, and so they began, it was picked up by a number of uh, critics of the Soviet Union, and so historically the field developed uh, as largely a Marxist field. And again, I'm speaking specifically about the uh, uh, application of economics to literature, but uh, uh, it has a lot to do with the prejudices of uh, those literary critics who deal with this sort of thing, namely, uh, they have a great deal of contempt for the commercial world. In this sense, feeding into this is a whole set of prejudices that are inherited from the Romantic period, uh, and a lot of critics in the 19th century who had a kind of aristocratic contempt for capitalism. And it's, there's a certain irony that in this case, the the left and Marxism have linked up with the old right, the anti-capitalist aristocratic right. I was just going to mention that, yeah. Yeah, that uh, uh, it is a kind of disdain for anything that could be commercial. Uh, and they do point to legitimate phenomena that there are ways in which you can say that literature uh, can be corrupted by commercial considerations. I've countered that, that with the idea that, in fact, in many ways, to the extent literature is involved in the marketplace, it actually gets better. And I've particularly written about the... Uh, uh, the way the 19th century novel developed in a very competitive marketplace and uh, Dickens novels, for example, were all the better for that. It's very hard for my colleagues to understand. Well, there is this sense uh, among some people, and I think we see this in modernism, for instance, you see it in, in the, the literary and artistic community, this uh, very much of a, a, a view that the common people shouldn't have to be catered to. I should be free to express myself however I want. Now, of course, you should be free to express yourself however you want, but what then follows from that is, since the common people are too stupid to recognize my literary merits, I ought to be subsidized. Exactly, exactly, and that's where these people uh, are making false claims. Uh, and I think a lot of modernism went wrong when it took this highly elitist path. path. Uh, and it has led, uh, particularly I'll, I'll say in music and painting, to forms of art that are just so hermetically sealed off from the universe that they're uh, essentially not worth anything to anybody except the artists themselves. Uh, I think one of the worst developments in 20th century art in general uh, has been uh, uh, the use of government subsidies to shield artists from the marketplace and allow them to indulge themselves in their uh, own petty ego-building uh, activities. Well, speaking, though, given that we started talking about Mises, I suppose we should mention that Mises more than once 
makes reference to detective stories as being a classic example of how the masses are interested in just meaningless pap. And he says that, look, that's what the market order is not there to make people better people. It's there to give them what they want. And unfortunately, what they want this crummy stuff. So even Mises had a bit of this. Yes, it's interesting to say he definitely came out of, again, that old world uh, cultural attitude and had exceedingly refined taste insofar as I can determine, uh, including in in uh, uh, literature. Uh, but uh, I, I, I hate to challenge Ludwig. Uh, I think in this regard, uh, he did not understand uh, the interplay between what's typically called uh, lower popular culture and higher elite culture. That is, yes, uh, there are many bad detective stories that people uh, are attracted to, but the form does lead to uh, make possible higher forms of literature. And so that, for example, Joseph Conrad's novel, The Secret Agent, is a variant on the detective story. It actually shows signs of having been influenced by Arthur Conan Doyle and the Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, in my view, all culture is in fact a pyramid in which the elite forms uh, are built on a rather broad base of common or popular forms. Uh, uh, and so I, for example, I would never condemn the detective story as a genre completely. There are many subtle uh, uh, and artistic detective stories, uh, even even the ones that Conan Doyle wrote. And so um, when you reject the whole genre, uh, I think it's a mistake and that we need to, uh, it's a perfect example of where what you need is a broad basis in culture. I actually see it as in effect Darwinian. Uh, you need all these people writing detective stories in a marketplace and uh, the form will actually get better over time uh, a critic named Franco Moretti who's a Marxist critic has written an essay on this, did a, did a vast study of 19th century detective stories and showed how over time the market widowed out the more subtle, complicated stories. Uh, believe it or not, uh, it was a long time before people, writers realized to base their stories on clues. But when audience responded better to clue-based stories, uh, authors started adopting them. So actually, the detective story is an interesting case where a genre evolves over time in a marketplace and actually gets better and better. All right. Uh, first of all, I'm blown away that you had that much to say about detective stories. I thought this was going to be a throwaway line. I didn't realize there'd been so hey, much. Hey, it's the way I, why I make the big box. Uh. <laughs> I didn't realize there'd been so much work done on it. Well, let's continue along this line because I used to be in some of these old right-wing sort of circles that you described that were weirdly anti-capitalist for cultural reasons. That, yes, of course, yeah. the market is if, – if a people becomes morally debased, the market is going to sell them – further moral debasement. So how can the market be considered a virtue when it plays into people's unformed uh, wishes? I mean, these, these are people who have no literary taste at all. Why should we be glad that they're being catered to is the standard argument. Well, I, I have a higher opinion of people <laughs> than these old acquaintances of yours. Uh, I actually think uh, general taste is not that bad, uh, uh, and I think it actually improves over time, uh, that you can see it in television, for example, that uh, uh, television has gotten more and more intellectually sophisticated over the decades. And I know there's a lot of people who still talk about it as if it was still the day of I Love Lucy in the 50s, but uh, uh, television, uh, like any genre, other genre, has evolved, and it's quite amazing to look at shows on television now and see what high expectations they have of the intellectual sophistication of the audience. Now, the moral issue is a separate one, and I have to admit, I don't get exercised over that myself. Uh, I'm not worried. Personally, I'm not worried about the morals of television. I'm very, I'm in some ways very much an esteem myself, and I'm interested in the intellectual sophistication. Uh, and there, it's quite amazing the process that has gone on between the American public and the creators of television, how increasingly sophisticated the works have become till we get to something like Breaking Bad, for example. Uh, 
Uh, uh, which, right, which you and I mentioned before we started talking. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, the, the writing in that show is so extraordinarily sophisticated, uh, and uh, the depth with which it approaches uh, its moral issues, it's really Shakespearean. Yeah, I want to get I want to get back to that because I I I loved that show and I think it's my favorite show of all time and it's interesting you know I when I I have to I'm raising five girls and I don't want them to be snobs but I do want them to have some cultivation so I want to I want to balance things and I for example a lot of the music I listen to is not very popular in the but that's still really good. And but at the same time, I say to them, I don't like it just because other people don't like it. I said my favorite show of all time is one of the most popular shows of all time. So it is possible, certainly for people to get things right. But yeah, I, I want to give an example that you've given in the past, which is, if, if I'm remembering this right, your claim is that a lot of times we're inclined to look at you know centuries or even millennia ago and say that was the golden age of literature and we'll look at the great dramas of of the greek world and we'll yeah. say look at these tremendous dramas but of course what we need to remember is the lousy ones didn't survive to us we have the prize winning ones the ones that people took the care to preserve for us exactly so that maybe if we put those up against the best that we have and we took their crummy ones and put them against our crummy ones we wouldn't come out so bad after all yes that's exactly my point uh that we have a roughly well we have about uh uh 33 Greek tragedies of some 1,000 that were produced in 5th century Athens. Uh, and they are the best of the lot. People never say, refer to the ones we've lost and know only by name and say these were better than Sophocles or Aeschylus' uh, or um, Euripides' plays. Uh, although the irony is that even the very best of the plays, Plato condemned and on moral grounds. Uh, and so we should always remember that when people make a blanket condemnation of the morality of television today, Plato was making a blanket condemnation of the Greek drama of his day, and he was specifically talking about Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, judging by the references in his dialogues. So I, I think people often overreact uh, on this moral question and don't appreciate the uh, issue of aesthetic sophistication. It's, of course, the same with Shakespeare. He was condemned for the immorality of his plays in his, in his own day, uh, and uh, uh, the whole theater that we now prize from Shakespeare's day, uh, the Puritans wanted to shut it down and actually did in 1642 when they came to power. Uh, so uh, what I see is a perpetual struggle between artists and a kind of policing uh, state uh, that wants to impose a limited conception of morality on what artists are doing. Uh, uh, let's jump back to the uh, Marxism question. If somebody is a Marxist literary critic, how am I going to be able to tell that in the person's work? What kind of themes or what kind of emphasis will I see? Well, just look for the word hegemony. Uh, look for the <laughs> okay. word commodify. and uh, Look for any four, five, six-syllable words. Uh, you know, what you will see is, uh, first of all, the, uh, the stressing of class consciousness, uh, that authors will be viewed as locked into a particular class consciousness usually middle-class consciousness, uh, and they will be treated uh, as the ideological dupes of capitalism and will be seen as offering uh, this false consciousness defense uh, of uh, uh, capitalism. Now, uh, uh, Marxist criticism uh, has morphed into cultural criticism now. The issue is less class now and more race and gender and ethnicity. Different set of prejudices, but the same basic idea. Uh, so that uh, uh, best sign of a Marxist critic or one of these uh, cultural critics now is that they don't uh, 
take the author seriously. Don't try to uh, try to understand authors uh, as they understand themselves. Uh, they're always trying to produce an argument that will either reveal the authors to be captive of some limited consciousness or uh, possibly in some cases they'll show an author who manages uh, to liberate himself and offer a kind of uh, socialist or uh, generally Marxist reading of the world. Uh, so, uh, uh, in general, what you will see in Marxist critics is a whole lot of theory and very little close reading of the works themselves to see what the authors themselves were trying to express, because they dismiss that as simply a false consciousness. Right, right. You see the word false consciousness, you know you've got yeah, that, there you go. <laughs> that would that would scream Marxism for you. I'm looking right now at the Amazon page for your book Gilligan Unbound, Pop Culture in the Age of Globalization. You have devoted scholarly attention to popular culture. Not everybody does. Uh, there are quite a few Marxists who uh, yeah. I've seen do it, and they do a terrible, terrible terrible job. Oppression everywhere uh, for, for them. They, they suck all the life and the fun out of everything. But yeah, I tried to restore, restore the fun to this. Yeah, so, what, so what's your work all about? Like, what, are you, what are you finding in popular culture? That, because other people, of course, would look down on that. Well, I mean, what I do is try to take these shows seriously and see what they get at. And in fact, you know, uh, in some ways, my test case was Gilligan's Island. Normally, I write about shows that I feel are, to some extent, sophisticated. In that book, I also discuss Star Trek, The Simpsons, and above all, The X-Files, which I think is one of the most sophisticated shows ever to be on television. I can't wait less than a month now till we'll see six more episodes of it. But um, Gilligan's Island was a kind of test case for me. It actually develops a rather interesting understanding of American democracy. Uh, and in particular, what I saw about it is it, it challenges all the traditional aristocratic claims to rule. Uh, Mr. Howell represents wealth and tradition. The skipper represents a kind of military prowess. And the professor represents brains and uh, the intellectual elite. And what it showed is that in America, the common man truly rules. Gilligan, uh, the man without qualities, to use an Austrian phrase uh, from Robert Musil, who I gather means this new. Uh, but anyway, Anyway, here's this guy who's just a kind of uh, ordinary uh, nobody, and yet he's always saving them. Uh, uh, and I actually was in contact with George Schwartz, who, who created the show, and he confirmed my interpretation of it. Uh, so I, uh, that's an example. I mean, again, I, I consider that the kind of uh, uh, extreme example. If you can find meaning in Gilligan's Island, you can find it in anything. Uh, but normally I try to write about shows that are much more sophisticated than that. And my point is to try to figure out what these creators are doing. I've tried to read pop culture shows uh, the way I learned to read Shakespeare. And sometimes, as in the case of Deadwood or Breaking Bad, these shows achieve an almost Shakespearean level uh, in their sophistication, the quality of the writing. Well, I'm a tremendous Simpsons fan. I could, I remember even in college, which was years and years and years ago, the show's been on so long, we could sit around for hours regaling each other with favorite Simpson moments and lines and just, I mean, Homer is so gloriously stupid that his lines are just astonishingly good. I don't know how they, how they came up with them, but I, I feel like I've got to, I'm just compelled to talk to you a little bit about Breaking Bad, which is my favorite show of all time. And I, I just happened to see a reference to it on Facebook. Somebody saying, hey, I'm really enjoying this show. And we were out of things to watch. So we decided, what the heck, we'll give this a try. And we were just glued. We couldn't stop watching it. It was, And the thing is that my experience with seeing Brian Cranston as an actor would not have led me to the conclusion that he could pull off this role. You know, it's funny. Uh, there's an episode of Malcolm in the Middle. I think it's the first episode of the season two where he becomes Walter White. Oh, uh, I, it's 
fascinating see I happened upon it by by accident but there's an episode where he has a dream sequence when he gets fed up with his wife uh, and having to kowtow to her and his anger comes out and that's a prof- I mean they obviously had no idea who Walter White was there but you could see in Brian Cranston the actor his capacity for that range it's, it's where he found his inner Walter White and I think it's a very in fact, profound comment on Breaking Bad I didn't see. Well, I, I barely watched that show, just enough to know I wasn't interested. But how about that? Because he just—he was just. I mean, all all the people on the show yeah. were just absolutely stunning in their performances. So good. You know that he was Jerry Seinfeld's dentist too. Uh, I I did I right. did recognize him there. That was the first yeah. role that I remembered him. I said, now this guy looks familiar to me. He was the guy he converted to Judaism for the jokes. Yes, he was. A, yes, and Jerry turned out to be an anti-dentite. Uh, but, <laughs> that's right. But he was in a great episode of the X Files called West, uh, and that's when Vince Gilligan got to know him and knew he was right for Walter White. But to watch him, what was weird about the show is I think of myself as a fairly upstanding individual. And yet, as the guy is descending into, you know, <laughs> the most horrifying behavior, I'm weirdly cheering for him. You know? Well, good for you, because uh, uh, I've met Vince Gilligan. I spent a good bit of time with him, uh, spent about 20 minutes with him once talking to him about the show. And I feel that he didn't get it, uh, that he thought we should be rooting against uh, That's Walter right. White, and uh, there was quite a division in the audience. And I'll just say this, that Vince Gilligan doesn't know what a tragic hero is. Uh, this is what I'm, I'm actually, it's oddly enough, I'm going to begin my work on uh, uh, Breaking Bad tomorrow, as it happens. Uh, I'm going to rewatch the whole show. But um, in in Gilligan's mind, there's only two alternatives a, a hero and a villain and he thinks this is a story of a nice man who became a villain but what I think the genius of Breaking Bad is and here uh, libertarians can uh, uh, get interested in the show is it shows how frustrating the modern world has become in the regulated administered state uh, where people have no outlets for their creativity where they end up teaching for the state in a boring high school job uh, and finally uh, through these strange circumstances of his cancer and uh, his desire to help his family that he finds something where he can put his talent to work this is a man who lived a tremendously frustrated life and yes he becomes a villain but he comes a, becomes a super villain I like to think of him as a kind of Clark Kent figure uh, that by day uh, he has this ordinary identity of a mealy uh, 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 ordinary guy who's put upon by everybody. but at night he becomes this superhero super villain he becomes Heisenberg uh, and suddenly I am the danger, as he puts it. He, he's not the person who has the cower and fear of everything around him, including his wife uh, and his relatives uh, and the high school regime. Suddenly, he's the man empowered, and that makes him, in my view, a tragic hero, like Macbeth, for example. Uh, I find it sad that when people talk about popular culture, they lose sight of this magnificent concept we get from Shakespeare, the tragic hero. And if you look at Macbeth, he does many, many evil things. He's a horrible man in that sense. Uh, and Shakespeare doesn't mitigate that. But he shows you how a decent, heroic man who is being celebrated by his community at the beginning of the play for hacking someone in half because the guy was on the other side, uh, how he is led by the frustrations of his situation uh, to become villainous in his deeds. Uh, so I, th- I think of Walter White as a tragic hero and the tragic hero of the modern condition of the administered world we live in. I'm very interested in Better Call Saul, this prequel. Uh, to, yeah. uh, and I've re- I wrote a piece for uh, uh, the, the Austrian uh, on Better Call Saul, uh, uh, giving this interpretation of it. Gilligan has a fascinating... This is Vince Gilligan, not the guy for... Uh, 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 Vince Gilligan has a, a wonderful feel for the frustrations of the modern bureaucratized world. 
where everybody feels like he's a cog in the machine. And really, the, the, the Walter White's journey was one of self-discovery. Uh, I don't mitigate the terrible things he did. Uh, right, but by but, the very end, he, he is honest with himself about what it was all about. Yes, and he has a, the kind of recognition, anagnoresis, as Aristotle says, of the tragic hero of recognizing that what he did was wrong and how destructive it was. But, uh, you know, like any tragic hero, he's a victim of his own greatness. Uh, that is precisely what's great about him uh, that destroys him, and it's what he discovers uh, in the course uh, of, uh, 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 of his developments about himself. And it is very, you know, when, one of his great recognitions in the last season is I did do this for myself, that I like yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, 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 we had all learned that about him years earlier, yeah. but he finally saw it. Yes. And it's, it's in a way very Nietzschean. Uh, it, it's a very, it's a profound show for all those reasons. Uh, and it had a very good concluding episode, oh, which is yes. hard to pull off. Uh, now, uh, Gil Gilligan from the beginning intended it to be five seasons. He didn't run his problems, say the X Files did, of dragging out the extra seasons and running out of material uh, and stars. And uh, so, from the beginning, he had uh, uh, an arc for the whole series, uh, but. They didn't know quite how to end it uh, 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 the, from the beginning, but they worked out the ending, tried out many different possibilities for the ending. It's a good example of how a show evolves and how they use feedback from the audience to get to the ending. But yes, uh, I, I, you know, I consider it the best written show of all time uh, because it had such a good ending. Deadwood, which would be my alternate choice, unfortunately didn't get to end where David Milch wanted it to end. It was cut off, and so, so it doesn't have that perfect closure that Breaking Bad does. Uh, I'm fascinated by this long form of the TV series now. Uh, it's unprecedented in the history of art. There's never been... Wagner's Ring Cycle uh, is a baby, uh, only 17 and a half hours long, compared to, I think... Uh, Breaking Bad's, I think, 62 episodes. Uh, these are tr tremendously challenging artistic forms, and Gilligan's uh, a master of it, uh, uh, as we're seeing now with Better Call Saul. Well, I kept marveling at all different things during the series, but even a small thing like uh, the, the range that Cranston had came through in every time after you reach a threshold after, you know, after which his wife realizes he's not a trustworthy person. Yeah. When he would tell a lie, we could tell we, – we knew it was a lie because we're sort of the omniscient observers, yeah. but we knew it was a lie. But he told it in a way that sounded almost plausible but is just fake enough to be a lie. And so that, in other words, he lies the way a real person lies. Like, it, you, you, you kind of almost believe it yourself, but it's not really coming out the way other things you say in the series are coming out. Somehow he got that subtlety exactly right, and we could see in her face that from the minute he opened his mouth, she knew it was a lie. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the dynamic well, again, was beautiful. Take, it's an interesting, again, I, it's a the example of what it takes to make a great show and how actors contribute to the show. Uh, now, again, we say Vince Gilligan created the show, and he did in a sense he wrote it, but he had a lot of help with the writing and, and a lot of help with the actors. Uh, you work with the actors and you start to learn what they can do and you press them further. They do it. They do it better than you thought and so you press them even further. That's how a show gets better and better and by the way, that happened to Shake Shakespeare. Uh, he was working with a set of actors. Uh, uh, he, the comedian in the group was a man who was named Will Kemp, who did a lot of dancing uh, uh, and little uh, 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 self dialogues He left the group. They brought in a guy named Robert Armin, who specialized in fools and was a good singer. And Shakespeare must have been so impressed with this guy, he wrote King Lear and created this part for the fool in that play, which seems like this incredible act of creative genius and was. And yet it never would have happened if he didn't have his Brian Cranston, if he didn't have Robert Armin there to show him that you could do a lot with this stock character, the fool. 
So that's what I talk about when I talk about the feedback process in the creation of art uh, that is actually uh, a factor of it being a marketplace phenomenon. Audiences love Robert Armin. Shakespeare says, I'm going to write the greatest part ever for a fool, and we're going to call it King Lear. Uh, and clearly, Gilligan was inspired by working with Brian Cranston and other actors in the show. Uh, well, Paul, f- fascinating conversation. I really appreciate uh, the the time. I mean, I've I, I guess I've met you once or twice, but I've always wanted to sit down and have this kind of conversation. I bet we could talk about Breaking Bad forever. Yeah. But if people want to follow what you're doing, is there a particular book they should read or website they should visit? Uh, well, they they should go to the book I did, Literature and the Economics of Liberty. Uh, it's published by the Mises Institute, and being what they are, they make a PDF of it available for free. So if you just go to Mises.org and look me up, you'll find this book. The co-editor is Stephen Cox uh, at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he's number two among Austrian economists. Uh, in <laughs> okay. And it's got essays by Dario Fernandez Barrera uh, and uh, uh, Tom Pizer and uh, uh, Chandran Kukathas, who's actually who's actually studied with Hayek uh, at the LSE, London School of Economics, and is now a professor at the London School of Economics. So he's, he's actually a, a political scientist, uh, but uh, uh, Dario Fernandez Marrero is a comparative literature professor, and uh, Tom Pizer is an English professor. Uh, uh, so uh, in that book, you can get a good sampling. There's essays on Don Quixote and Walt Whitman and Joseph Conrad. You can get a good sample of what we'll call, call an Austrian approach uh, 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 to literary criticism. A uh, former student of mine named Michael Valdez Moses has written a book called uh, The Novel and the Globalization of Culture, which above all has an essay on Mario Vargas Llosa, the great Peruvian author mm. uh, who is very sympathetic to capitalism uh, and uh, a kind of disciple of Hernán de Soto. And so uh, this, you know, that's, that's the handful, right? Oh, oh yes, Fred Turner, uh, Shakespeare in 21st Century Economics, six-figured hand there. there. You've got the six literature professors that I know of that deal with uh, 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 Austrian economics. Uh, but uh, beyond that, you can go to YouTube. I did a series of lectures on commerce and culture for the Mises Institute that are available there, where I develop a lot of these ideas at length, and lectures on classical music and on painting and, and on movies and television. Uh, so uh, uh, you, you just search my name on YouTube. Uh, you can find a lot of stuff there, and it's all free. <laughs> Well, I'm going to make it easier on people. We'll link to it. This is episode 560. So at tomwoods.com slash 560, we'll link to the book that you mentioned, and we'll link to that series of lectures. We'll also link to some of your other work. So the clearinghouse page for this episode is tomwoods.com slash 560. Professor Cantor, thanks so much again for your time. Thank you for having me on your show. All right, that's the episode for today. tomwoods.com slash 560 is where to get all these great resources. And remember, don't be like bad luck Joe. January 1st, 2016, the price of a master membership at libertyclassroom.com goes up by $150. It's a lifetime membership, gets you every course we ever create. Bob Murphy has a bunch of courses that he's ready to put out. we got a whole bunch of great people from the Liberty Movement, top-notch people, all PhDs, all well-published, highly credentialed, super reliable, super sound. They're going to teach you the stuff that we should have been taught in school, real history, real economics, philosophy, all kinds of great stuff. It's all there at libertyclassroom.com. And if you get the master membership, you're going to save 150 bucks if you get it before the end of 2015. So don't take a chance that you're going to remember on New Year's Eve, because you're not. So head on over there now, check it out. We'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.